York show someone that they know them and that they love them through food. Growing up, each member of our family always had their favorite meal on their birthday. My grandma was an exceptional cook and perceptively observant. The majority of the Yorks live in southern Wisconsin. In order to find enough land to have a dairy farm, we moved five hours north, too long of a trip to make between milkings. I only saw my grandparents about once a year. Every time I visited them, Grandma made a feast of a variety of foods and a variety of cookies. And Grandma watched what I ate. And then later, about once a month, I got a tin in the mail from Grandma that had my favorite cookies. It was how she showed me that she knew me and loved me. Now, Grandpa, he always carried a variety of hard candies in his pockets and chocolates and caramels as well. And he learned that of all of them, my favorite was the Kraft Caramel Square. So whenever we did some project together, there would be some time in there that we would both sit down and we would each take out, or he would take out two caramels and we would enjoy those caramels together. Now, over the years, I have come to know many people who show their love through food. And I am blessed to have several people who know my favorite treats and will buy them for me. Some people place them in my office, and of course, Leslie Spencer and Abigail will buy them for me at home. I am blessed to have people know me and love me. It's a wonderful joy to be known and to be loved. Timothy Keller wrote, To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be both fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. In her book on being known, Julie Ackerman wrote this. One of the most difficult inner conflicts we have is our desire to be known versus our fear of being known. As beings created in the image of God, we are made to be known, known by God and also by others. Yet due to our fallen nature, all of us have sins and weaknesses that we don't want others to know about. We use the phrase dark side to refer to aspects of our lives that we would prefer to keep hidden. And we use slogans like, put your best foot forward, to encourage others to show their best side. One reason we are unwilling to risk being known is that we fear rejection and ridicule. But when we discover that God knows us, loves us, and is willing to forgive even the worst thing we have done, our fear of being known by God begins to fade away. And when we find a community of believers who understands the dynamic relationship between forgiveness and confession, we feel safe confessing our sins to God and to others. The life of faith is not about showing only our good side. It's about exposing our dark side to the light of Christ through confession to God and also to others. In this way, we can receive healing and live in the freedom of forgiveness. Luke tells us how after discussing scripture as Jesus broke bread, their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. The word recognized can be translated well-known. Literally, it means that once their eyes were opened, they knew Jesus well. The risen Jesus knows those weary wanderers before they know him. God knows you completely. God knows everyone through and through. Chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Easter afternoon, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. 
As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. They talked and discussed these things. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But they were not able to recognize who Jesus was. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. One of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. Jesus was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped Jesus was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the that the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all of these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, Stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So Jesus went home with them. As they sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. Then Jesus broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized Jesus. At that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as Jesus talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were back on their way to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, The Lord has really risen. Jesus appeared to Peter. Each of us is fully known by God and fully loved by God. We can start to know God through food and scripture According to Luke, the two disciples recognized Jesus by walking together, discussing scripture, which sparked their recognition. They described it as their hearts beginning to burn. This recognition was fueled by Jesus sharing a meal with them. Jesus probably served this meal precisely how each of them preferred their meal, probably serving each of them their favorite food. One aspect of God's extravagant love is God loves each of us how we want to be loved in our love language. God honors the uniqueness God created in us by delighting in our uniqueness and communicating in our preferred style. God is creative. God made vast variety. God created and sustains a cosmos that is continually expanding in diversity expanding in love and joy. God knows your favorite food and delights in sharing it with you. The worship of Protestant churches is inspired by recognizing God through scripture and food. We call it word and sacrament. As we begin to know God, we become more and more able to love God. And as we discover our true selves through word and sacrament, we are able to more fully love ourselves. And as we learn more about others through word and sacrament, we are more fully able to know and love them as well. The Protestant reformers declare there are two essential marks of the church. 
word and sacrament. John Calvin stated, wherever you have the word truly proclaimed and the sacraments rightly administrated, there you have the true church of Jesus Christ. The Presbyterian Church insists on word and sacrament at every worship service. Scripture is always to be proclaimed in some form, and the sacraments are always to be celebrated. The sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper are physical signs of God's redeeming grace freely offered to all people. The water and food are physical signs that illustrate the love of the Holy Spirit, healing and uniting all people with love. When we do not physically share the physical elements of baptism and the Lord's Supper, it is called a dry celebration. The table commonly used for the celebration of Holy Communion is to remain visible in the church, as is the baptismal font, to inspire recognition, knowing of God and each other. Therefore, just by us seeing them, it is to spark that recognition. So we always celebrate the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism, even if we don't physically pour the water and partake of food and drink. And when the deacons and I provide communion to those unable to attend worship, you guessed it, we go out and we always read scripture, so there is always both word coupled with sacrament. Reformed theology believes whenever, wherever we explore scripture together and share a meal together, either literally or virtually, our knowing of God, knowing of others, and knowing of self is enhanced, which enables us to more fully love God, love others, and love ourself. There is another place in scripture where the word we translate recognize, and well-known occurs. It's in 1 Corinthians. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. A more literal translation is, then I will know well, even as I have been well-known. It's not about fame. It's about recognition. The moment of looking into the eyes of another and seeing them as more than a reflection are a projection of yourself, seeing their uniqueness, seeing their eternal essence, their love, and their joy. The Apostle Paul is known for his circular logic and run-on sentences. Listen to the context as he tries to explain knowing and loving. Corinthians chapter 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but do not love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of insight, and if I understood all of God's mysteries and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I did not love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable, and love keeps no record of being wronged. Love does not rejoice about wrongdoing, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the complete comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God 
now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. There is a story about the funeral of Charlemagne, holy Roman emperor and ruler of the Frankish people in the Middle Ages. Not since the fall of Rome had one king unified so much of Western Europe under his rule. Charlemagne governed most of present-day France, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Italy. When this renowned emperor died, his soldiers bore his casket in a mighty procession from his castle to the great cathedral. There, the procession was met by the local bishop. He physically barred the cathedral doors with his body. Who comes? the bishop demanded according to ancient custom. Charlemagne, lord and king of the holy Roman emperor, proclaimed the emperor's herald. Him I know not, the bishop replied. Who comes? The herald, a bit shaken, replied, Charles the Great, a good and honest man of the earth. Him I know not, the bishop said again. Who comes? Trying a third time, the herald responded, Charles, a lowly sinner who begs the gift of Christ. To which the bishop, Christ's representative on earth, responded, Enter. Receive Christ's gift of life. Charlemagne during his life was certainly well known, but in death the only knowing that truly mattered was the fact that he was and always will be fully known by God. Another aspect of our scripture to ponder. As Jesus and the two disciples completed their walk, Jesus makes as if to travel on. But they urged Jesus strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So Jesus went in and stayed with them. God is always with us, so what is happening here? Stay with us reveals our human tendency to resist ever-expanding love. Many want God to stay in the box that they have constructed for God. Many want God to act in familiar ways. Many want to control God. God continuously invites us to expand our knowing of God, knowing of self and knowing of others, and to continually expand our love. And yet, God met those disciples and meets us where we are at. God does indeed stay with us. But, However, we are stuck in unloving ways, limiting our love of certain people in certain situations with certain lifestyles. God stays with us, leading, sculpting, pushing, prodding, until we are able to know a little bit more and to love a little bit more. God is always with us, and God is always on the move, ever expanding the knowledge love, and joy of the cosmos. So I wonder, how much of someone's desire to experience church in a familiar building, with familiar music, with a familiar liturgy, with a familiar time, echoes the disciples' plea, stay with us? How much of someone's desire to have people live, act, think, and believe like themselves echoes the disciples' plea, Stay with us. God is continually offering us fresh experiences to expand our knowing and to expand our loving. I am able to enjoy a wider variety of food today because I was courageous enough to try some new foods along the way in my life. So if you're struggling to love someone, to love yourself or love God. Strive to know them more. And if you're struggling to love, then str strive to love in a new facet, in a new way, in a new form. Love in a way that you have not tried before. 
The risen Jesus is always traveling with us. The risen Jesus fully knows you and is nourishing you with all you need. The risen Jesus loves you completely. Strive to know God, know others, know yourself, so you can more fully love God, love others, and love yourself. Amen.